How we rose the voice in the Mets on 710 WOR. Mr. Rose, thanks for your time today. I appreciate it. My pleasure, Neil. Nice to see you. It's a pleasure to have you here at City Field. Now, let's talk about this 2015 Mets team. Stellar pitching staff, as we know. Matt Harvey on the Hill today on this July 11th. Um, but the hitting right now has been poor, to say the least. What do you? What's your analysis of the 2015 team? Well, I think they'd be in a little bit better shape if some of the veterans that they have had been able to perform a little better in the aftermath of some of the injuries. You can't simply replace David Wright. You can't simply replace Travis Darno. They need more from Lucas Duda. They need more from Michael Kadire. Maybe last night was a good turning point. We'll see as the weeks progress. Certainly Curtis Granderson has been streaky. They probably need more consistent production from him. There are enough bats here so that with their pitching as good as it's been, they should be able to compete. Now, there's questions about whether or not the ownership is willing to spend the money and willing to maybe trade a young pitcher for a bat. Are you opposed to trading one of these young pitchers for a bat? Play GM for a moment. Well, right now I am, and I'll just name Harvey, DeGrom, Syndergaard, Mats, Zach Wheeler, who's recovering from Tommy John. That's the future of this franchise now. And as we've seen with pitchers, their success can be somewhat ephemeral. Their health can be quite ephemeral. And I think that ultimately you have strength in numbers when you have depth in pitching. And you can certainly make the case that you could probably deal one of them to bring in a bat. And I'm not saying that's something they wouldn't do somewhere down the line. Right now, I'm not so sure that they should do it because they're developing something really, really special here. Now, what about ownership? Do you believe that the Will Ponds have the money? Or, you know, what do you what do you think's the issue there? Do you think that they're willing to go out and spend the money right now? Questions about Sandy Alderson, whether or not he has the power. Well, they don't show me the W-2s, so I can't tell right. you if they have it, if they're not willing to spend it, if they're waiting for the right time to spend it. You know, that's private family business, and I'm not privy to it. All right, let's talk about Steven Matz. He got hurt the other day, um, and as we know, he's on the shelf for three weeks. Talk about, say, the pitching in Major League Baseball. There, uh, it seems like pitching is in an abundance right now and really dominating the game, but maybe not as many big bats. So what's your opinion on the state of pitching in Major League Baseball? Compare that with the bats in Major League Baseball. Uh, clearly, the numbers would show you it's a pitcher's game right now, and whereas you used to be lucky if you had one arm you could bring out of the bullpen who throws 95 and is imposing and a power pitcher and intimidating. Every team's got three or four of them now, or so it appears. It's just the way the game has evolved. And these things often are cyclical, and that's not to suggest that where we're at now is where we're going to be forever. Uh, right now, there is a strength and a, a, you know, a, a tremendous amount of pitching and uh, a relative dearth of offense. But when you look at a kid like Paul Goldschmidt in here with the Diamondbacks, and, a youngster like Bryce Harper, who's had the breakthrough year, and Mike Trout, you know, a great young player with the Angels. There are good young hitters in this game. We just need to develop a few more of them. Last well, question on the 2015 team. How far away do you think the Mets are from contending? They're there right now, and at least when you look at the standings. As we speak, on the 11th of July, there are two games out of first place. There are two games out of a wild card. It's a different game than it was in the 60s and 70s and 80s with so many different ways now to qualify for the postseason. That's why it's going to be really interesting to see what happens over the next few weeks when we get down to the trade deadline and, you know, if the Mets are still in that position, whether they can compete. Javi Rose, voice of the Mets. Let's talk about the Hall of Fame now. Start off with the Met, Mike Piazza, who missed the Hall of Fame for the third time, 69.9% of the vote back in January. Do you think that Mike Piazza belongs in the Hall of Fame? I mean, it seems like Mets fans here think he's a no-brainer. I do. I think he'll get there, perhaps as soon as the next vote. I feel there is an inevitability to Mike Piazza's going to Cooperstown. Now, how come he's been held out? Obviously, the question's about maybe performance-enhancing drugs. Do you speculate that with Piazza? Uh, not that much, but I think that he's part of an era where everybody's under some suspicion, and I think he's somewhat victimized by that. Uh, only he knows the answer as to whether or not he ever indulged. Uh, I don't have any evidence that he did, and I think that's in part why he'll ultimately find his way to Cooperstown. All right, when people think Mike Piazza, they think about the game after 9-11 when baseball returned to New York, and they think about you and, and your famous home run call. When you look back at that moment in, in Mets history, and obviously Mike Piazza um, bringing the crowd to their feet in the eighth inning, what's the first thing you think of? 
You know, I think of it less as a baseball moment and certainly less as a Mets moment than I do a, a piece of Americana because there was so much happening in this city, but more to the point, this country and our world at that time, where that home run transcended whatever it did on the scoreboard or meant to the standings. It gave people who had been so stunned and so hurt, and in many cases, so permanently touched that they had, for however brief a moment it was, an opportunity to smile and enjoy a baseball game. And even if it was only for the amount of time that it took Mike to circle the bases, it was an opportunity for those people to get some relief, however temporary it might have been. That really, as I say, transcends what went up on the scoreboard or what the standings looked like in the papers the next day. And so I've always looked at that as more than a, a Mets moment or a baseball moment. Right. I, I would tend to agree. I mean, you think about sports and, and history coming together and, you know, definitely sports playing a part of getting your mind off of that. Now, I want to ask you about the 2015 class. Craig Biggio, first thing that comes to mind about Biggio, they were one team with the Astros, 20 years. First thing that comes to mind when you hear the name Craig Biggio. Consistent. I mean, he was a terrific hitter for the entirety of his career. He was versatile. He did it's something that's pretty difficult. You go from behind home plate to second base to center field. I even forget what order it was in now. But that's not an easy thing to do. And to do it at a high level for as long as he did it, apart from the 3,000 hits. He's a Long Islander. I salute <laughs> you. Is. And um, I think it's great that Craig Biggio is going in. Now, Randy Johnson, 22 years. He had a perfect game, second all-time in strikeouts. What do you think about when you think about Randy Johnson? Imposing, as intimidating as a pitcher as perhaps there ever was in the game. Pedro Martinez played for the Mets, and obviously Pedro going in as a Red Sox. He had a great 1999 season, 23 wins that year. What's your opinion of Pedro Martinez? How was he in the clubhouse? Uh, he was great in the clubhouse. He kept everybody loose. In fact, I think my favorite memory of Pedro had nothing to do with performance as much as it did attitude. We were still at Shea Stadium, and Pedro is on the mound, getting ready to begin an inning, as I recall. It might have even been after he'd retired a batter, but he's out there taking his warm-up pitches, and suddenly the sprinklers go on. And all of a sudden, you've got X number of sprinkler heads that come up, and there's water being shot I think around I remember the this. entire infield. And believe me, there are a lot of pitchers who would look at a situation like that and be affected because they're such creatures of habit. And when they're thrown out of their routine and get away from what the norm is, uh, they panic and they struggle. Pedro was the happiest kid in the whole ballpark. He's the one who stood to be most affected, but he was out there dancing through the rain. <laughs> Who's your daddy, and, right? And yeah, I mean, that's just Pedro. <laughs> right. He was a tra and is a tremendously intelligent person, an intuitive person. He learned the language in a way that most people coming here from a foreign country don't. You learn how to use the language. And, I think that intelligence played a role in his uh, pitching performance as well. I, I, he's no question first ballot Hall of Famer. Now, John Smoltz, the last guy that is being inducted this year, he is a guy that you've seen a lot as a starter opposing the Mets and as a closer also. Something unique. What's your opinion of John Smoltz? I look at him as kind of a pitching version of Craig Biggio. Huh. He excelled in two totally different ways, just as Biggio did at two totally different positions. He fought back from Tommy John surgery, was better than ever eventually. And uh, I, again, tip my hat to someone who was able to, A, recover from adversity, and B, show an almost unparalleled, with the possible exception of uh, 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 Dennis Eckersley, uh, to uh, an extreme in two different areas that are very, very hard to do. So again, no doubt a Hall of Famer in my mind. Javi Rose, he's the voice of the Mets on the Mets Radio Broadcast 710 WOR. Mr. Rose, thanks for taking the time today. Appreciate My pleasure, it. Neil. Good luck. Thank you.